What's up, y'all? Shuffle. In today's video, is going to be talking about a few more unconventional builds that you can tinker around with, maybe incorporate them into your game for Darkest Dungeon. And before we get started, as always, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. Leave your comments down below, and if you want to check out the Discord, or not the Discord, the description box below for Discord, Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon, all of that cool stuff, then that would be greatly appreciated. The three builds that I'm offering today will seem pretty close to normal in some respects, but honestly, what changes is how you play them and your trinket options. So we're going to start off with Flagellant. In Flagellant, everyone's used to him being a bleed damage dealer with some support stuff. And I'm not going to pitch something as nuanced as just totally support Flagellant, like you can put him in rank 4, at least not yet. And if you want to run things like Suffer and Endure, you usually have to have some kind of plan in mind or a specific fight that you're trying to counteract with them, especially Suffer. So I'm not going to suggest that right now, I'm sorry Thick, but for Flagellant himself, I think a lot of people don't realize how good of a healer this character is. I would go so far as to say he's probably the second best healer in the game. He might be the third, depends on how much you actually value Arbalest, but honestly I think Flagellant is probably the second best healer just because he has the ability to give restoration through Reclaim and that is very powerful, we'll talk about that in a sec. Then he has Exsanguinate to keep his own HP up, and then he has Redeem to heal himself as well as someone else. Plus, if he hits 0 HP, then that triggers a group heal for your entire party. This means that because of Flagellant's abundant sources of healing, plus restoration from Reclaim, he can be the solo healer for your party with no issue at all. As long as you are preemptively putting Reclaim on people, because it only heals incremental amounts, then you should be okay unless there's some kind of weird chain of crits or whatever, but that kills pretty much anyone. The nice part about Restoration 2, since it is a heal over time effect that occurs on the unit's turn, that means if they are suffering from bleed or blight, plus Restoration, even at Death's Door, they cannot die from that. At least that specifically, not the damage over time effect. So what happens is, even if they're at 0 HP, they will get the heal from Restoration first, and then take the damage from the bleed or blight and go straight back down to Death's Door. So that's pretty cool, which means that spamming Reclaim is a perfectly viable and good strategy. The final thing that I like about Reclaim, it's one of my favorite skills in the game, is that every single individual tick of the restoration effects, or every time it goes off, you know, per round, it has a chance to crit. So that means you're giving yourself three chances of critting with that heal, which not only gives you bonus healing, but also stress relief. So if you've not tried main healer Flagellant, give it a shot. And I should reiterate that he can still do really good damage even in a full healer setup, and all he needs to enable this is to have bleed resist. So giving him something that is just pure bleed resist, like the blood charm or fortifying garlic, is perfectly fine. The bleed amulets is actually not as good for this build. You can still make it work, but the fact that it gives you bleed chance on top of bleed resist means that the bleed chance for Reclaim also goes up, which means you have more chances to bleed yourself from it. Next is Control Bounty Hunter. This is something I advocate for quite frequently. It's also why I think Wounding Helm is a trash item, because Bounty Hunter has two stuns and the ability to move other units on top of his pretty solid damage output, which means that you don't really have to turn on the big damage numbers at the start of every single fight. You certainly can if you want to. But I think Bounty Hunter as a character is much better if you give him one kind of stun trinket like Dazzling Charm and then let him disrupt the enemy team for the first two or three rounds and then he can turn on the damage at the end and help clean up kills. Or you can just turn it on if you're in trouble. He has two stuns, so he has Uppercut and Flashbang. Both of these are really good. They disrupt the front and the back line respectively. So as long as you can identify whatever the big threat is on Bounty Hunter's turn, then you can uppercut it to the back or flashbang it either, you know, to the front or back or all the way to the front or whatever. And it's always going to be effective. It's not just the stuns, which are both, you know, awesome. And as I say in most of my videos talking about stuns, stuns win everywhere. That's why they're so good. But you also have Come Hither, which is a move that pulls units out of the back of the party. So no matter what team you are running, Bounty Hunter has something to do that can usually help someone else either by stunning enemies or moving other ones or debuffing their prot with Mark for Death. He has a lot of other things he could be doing. I haven't even talked about Caltrops. So he has a lot of other stuff he could be doing before he even starts swinging his axe and killing enemies. My overall point is that if you are someone who thinks that why run Bounty Hunter when Highwayman exists, then just remember that Highwayman doesn't have two stuns, he doesn't have disruption abilities, so why not give Bounty Hunter a shot? The dude can go into rank one, two, or three of your party, or even four, depending on what the build is, 
but he's pretty comfortable in most spots and it's pretty hard to get him out of position because even if you knock him from one to three, he can still do pretty much anything he wants. It's also not hard to build Bounty Hunter, just give him any source of accuracy and then some stun chance and he's going to do fine. The last character we're going to talk about is Arbalest slash Musketeer. I'm using Musketeer in my background footage, but she plays exactly the same as Arbalest, so don't worry about that. But Arbalest is pretty interesting because there's a few different things she can do for your party. Sure, your first inclination is going to be use her as a ranged damage dealer, which is perfectly fine. She can do that. You can use Sniper Shot and just, you know, pop whatever's in the back line that's squishy. You can set her up with a mark if it's a beefier target or if you just need to kill something quickly with a high priority. Sure, you can do that. But I'm here to talk to you about support Arbalest slash Musketeer. This is something I think people don't value enough. So we're going to talk about what it is and how to incorporate it into your game. Like everything we've talked about in this video, it is not difficult to build. You can still use Sniper Shot and you can still use the Bandage, which are both fantastic moves. And then you just have to put on Suppressing Fire and I guess the Flare is probably the best fourth move. If you're running Musketeer, these are both Smokescreen and Skeet Shot respectively. Flare gets some surprising amount of value, especially later on in the game because more units find themselves in stealth, which makes them a bit dangerous. Although Arb is kind of slow, which makes flaring them not as important, but if you get a surprise, for instance, then it can be sometimes worth doing, or if she high rolls on speed. But flare has a lot of other good things attached to it. It clears mark, it raises torch, which can be helpful in a pinch, it has a chance of stress healing, which I don't know why, it just feels like Red Hook kind of slapped it on there as, you know, just something to do. But it also clears mark and stun. These are pretty good things to be able to get rid of. Mark Synergy has the potential to show up in every zone thanks to Cultus because Cultus Witch can mark enemies and then Cultus Brawler can punch you for Mark Synergy. So just by that alone, that means that Mark Synergy can show up in every single zone in the game. Courtyard's a bit different, but I'm not going to get into that. Stuns being the other one is pretty relevant because stuns for the player are usually very strong. I think they're one of the strongest things that you can do in the game. Which means that if you get stunned from the enemy, that can be pretty devastating. Even if you don't immediately hit Death Door, if someone gets crit and they have a bleed on top of them, or if they get crit back to back, and then your healer gets stunned in between that, that's when you can lose people. It doesn't matter what else was going on necessarily, it's just that you got locked down at the wrong time. This is one of the few times where Arbalest lower speed kind of plays into her favor, because all of the enemies are going to go and get their turns. Yeah, they might get their Mark Synergy that turn, but they won't get it next turn. So they set up their marks, they set their stuns or whatever happens, and then Arb with her slower speed gets to go at the end of the round and then flare and clear it off everyone. The other reason I am advocating for support Arbalest, if that's what you can even call it, it's more kind of like hybrid Arbalest, I guess, but there is a really good move called Suppressing Fire and Smokescreen. This move is a heavy debuff that lowers the accuracy of the two enemies in the back by a substantial amount, as well as lowering their crit by that same amount for two turns instead of three. I do wish it was longer, but the debuff is so potent that I'm actually okay with it being two turns. My favorite part about Suppressing Fire is that the crit debuff is so heavy on it that outside of like Blood Moon or Torchless or something like that, most enemies in the game will go to zero crit. That means that if you hit Suppressing Fire on the majority of enemies in the game, they cannot crit you from that point until the debuff is gone, and that's just with one stack of it. That is incredibly safe against some of the stronger backline enemies or some of the more annoying ones like gun bandits that like to cleave your entire team and get like two crits and cause a bunch of stress. You shut that down. On top of that, like I said, it lowers their accuracy so they can just miss you entirely, which is awesome. That helps either dodge teams or stalling or just keeping you alive. And it also does a very little amount of damage. This can be helpful for two reasons. One, it can be low enough that it can still chip people out if they get down to like one or two HP. Pretty nice. But the other is, if you want to stall, it's not going to kill enemies quickly. You're only doing two, three, you know, damage at a time, which means that you can stretch out the fight and get more heals off. Plus, debuff resist is pretty consistently low on most enemies. There are some that have higher than normal, like Virago and stuff. But for the most part, debuff resist is one of the lower enemy stats just across the board, which means that you can stick suppressing fire without having to invest in trinkets, although it is nice to do so. I think that being able to do these support moves with Arbalest makes the class a bit more fun. You're not as much reliant on her to do high amounts of damage quickly like a lot of other heroes are. Instead, she can like do kind of what Bounty Hunter does where she can chip in with some damage when needed or neutralize the backline or contribute with heals. Combine all of that on a unit that has one of the highest HP totals in the game behind Leper, Crusader, and Man-at-Arms and that's pretty freaking good if you ask me.
I also think that if you want to go other quirky builds like Frontline Bonk Vestal, then Arbalest is one of the best characters to run with that because she can supplement the single target healing as well as reach into the backline. Alright y'all, that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks for watching. So if you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up. Check out the box below like we always talk about in these videos. As for stuff coming up, I'm going to do the hidden stats guide soon. I'm still finalizing some stuff. There's a couple things that I know about, but I don't know the exact numbers, so I have to go digging for them. And it's actually been pretty hard finding some of that stuff. So the one that I'm having trouble with specifically is I heard that if you miss in this game, it gives you like a passive, unseen, invisible, whatever, like accuracy buff until you hit something. So it doesn't just lock you out of, you know, hitting stuff. And I thought that was pretty interesting. So I want to find out what that is exactly. So actually, if you know about it, please drop it in the comments so I know. And besides that, I'm going to try and get out as many just guides as I can over the next couple weeks before Darkest Dungeon 2 comes out. I would really love to finish my character guide series. I may have to just get them down to like 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30. We'll see. I don't want to rush and sacrifice quality, but I also want to get it done just so I don't have to leave it on the table, you know? And besides that... The other thing that I'm excited to get started is the final part of the regular, just normal playthrough character tier list. This is the set of videos that I guess, like, I don't want to say made me famous, like, I'm, you know, I'm just some dude, but those videos are what got me into YouTube more mainstream than what I was doing before. They also got my channel into partner status, and they're worth almost a million views between the, the three or four of them at this point, which is pretty awesome. And I've always been making the joke that I'm going to make a part 6 out of 3 once Darkest Dungeon 2 is announced, at least with a date. And we finally got that date. So since we have the release date, I'm going to make that video probably in the next week or two. And then I'm going to make it my first premiere video. I've never done it. I don't know if it's even something people want. But I'm going to do it and I'll set it up for like a Saturday or something. So if you're interested, then you'll see it and then you can set the reminder and all that. So that's going to be it for this one. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you next time.